if you're here, you're either a sponsor or a guest of a sponsor, and we want to give you a warm welcome and a thank you, because without you, the forecast project wouldn't be possible. So thank you very, very much. I'd like to give special thanks to our founding sponsor, Santa Barbara Bank and Trust. Our platinum sponsor, Montecito Bank and Trust. And our gold sponsor, Chase Bank. We are also so appreciative of the Fess Parker who has worked so closely with us and has, is hosting this event today. And they have just been fantastic to work with and the food is delicious and they've just been wonderful. So I also wanna thank them very much. I wanna ask you all to mark your calendar for next year, May 2nd, Thursday, May 2nd, will be the day of our uh, annual forecast event. It will be at the Granada Theater again. And just as in past years, any of the sponsors who are at a business associate level or higher will be invited to the reception that we have the evening before at the Valley Club. It's always very, very nice, and so we encourage you to sponsor at that level, and that's a, that's a very nice event. So we look forward to that. We've got uh, two speakers for you today. I am going to first introduce, uh, introduce Dan Walters, who is, I, I don't know if you could think of a journalist who knows as much about California politics as Dan. Uh, over 7,500 columns published in the state, several books. Uh, he's been doing this for over 50 years, and his syndicated column appears in 50 newspapers in California, so we're very excited. We haven't seen him in a couple of years. We think the timing's great, a week after the election. I'm pretty sure we're gonna hear some interesting things from him today. So Dan Walters. Well, thank you very much. Nice to be back in Santa Barbara again. Did we have an election last week? I can't remember. <laughs> Seems so long ago, doesn't it seem like no, it was just like yesterday. It's a, you always know there's going to be an election because it's a, a year divisible by two. So you know it's going to be an election year. And we were kind of a, uh, I guess you'd say kind of a backwater in this presidential election. Uh, the two candidates managed to ignore California, the nation's most populous state, very well, I thought. <laughs> they would sneak into town occasionally, into L.A. or to San Francisco or sometimes San Jose and scoop up a bunch of money and and then wave as they left town with their pockets bulging with cash from whoever they got the money from. Other than that, they didn't care. Everybody knew what was going to happen in California. Hey, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. So uh, we, did, we had a Senate race, supposedly, but not really. And Dianne Feinstein, who I guess considers herself senator for life, uh, was reelected to still another uh, six-year term. Uh, and it's amazing when you think about it that all of the top elected positions in California are now held by septuagenarians. Dianne Feinstein, Barbara Boxer, Jerry Brown. I mean, look, they could have their own old folks home if they kept it up, and <laughs> I could probably join them pretty easily. Uh, almost there, almost there. But there's not much movement at that level. I mean, you know, the old folks have got it here for a while. You know, California's a state that that prides itself on its youth and everything, and yet we elect nothing but old people to office. It's a very strange thing. Also very frustrating, I might add, to the generation just below them, the uh, Antonio Villaragosa and Kamala Harris and, and uh, Gavin Newsom and some of those people who in their 40s and 50s who would just love to run for high office, but they got no place to run because the old folks have taken it all. Kind of like Social Security, the old folks have taken it all. So we didn't have a Senate election, truthfully. But in its own way, California's election last week was very, very interesting uh, in three, really three respects. First of all, we saw a different kind of electorate come out at this, at this election. And the pollsters and the demographers and the pundits and the junkies are still debating all of this furiously and Twitter and everything. But 
Let me tell you what's been happening over the last oh, 10 or 15 years. California, as we all know, has been changing pretty dramatically. Uh, the, uh, my tribe, <laughs> it's probably the same tribe as many of you in this room, that's the old white people tribe, has been, has been declining. We don't produce babies many babies anymore, and we're getting older and frankly dying off, and so our tribe has been decreasing. You know, the white population of California is down to about 41 or 42 percent, something like that, of, of the population. And within probably three or four more years, in fact, the Latino community in California will become the largest single uh, ethnic group. But even despite all those changes and the rise of the Asian population and other things that have been going on, most of the voters, the vast majority of voters, have been middle-aged white people. Half the voters have been over 50, and about 70% of them have been white. That's been the pattern in elections for some years. But a different pattern emerged last Tuesday. And the dimensions of that emergence are still, like I say, being debated. But we, we know some clue to it from the exit polling. Exit polling is the sneaky little thing that people in the news media do. Uh, we hire people to go out and ask people how they have voted as the voting is going on. And from that, then, as soon as the polls close at 8 o'clock, we can say who won based on the exit polling. And it's quite accurate, by the way. And, uh, but we also know from exit polling who the voters are because the exit pollsters not only ask how you voted, but they ask them all sorts of questions about essentially who they are, you know, what gender, if it's not obvious, what gender they are, uh, their age bracket, their income bracket, their ethnicity, their, uh, you know, how religious they are, how often they attend church, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff that goes on to making up a, what you might call a demographic profile. Well, the demographic profile that emerged from the exit polling last week was a lot different than has been true in recent elections. Instead of 70% white, according to the exit poll, only about 55% of the voters were white. Uh, instead of being 50% uh, over 50 years old, only about a third over 50 years old, and so forth and so on. In other words, there's a younger, more uh, multiracial uh, group of voters than had voted in the past. Now, in, since then, there have been some kind of revisionist analysis going on of that because there was, that was a big contrast not only with recent polls or recent voting performances but also with the last pre-election field poll that showed it would be pretty much the same electorate's been voting before, 70 percent white and so on. So people have been mashing numbers like crazy and the consensus seems to be that maybe it wasn't quite as dramatic a change as the exit polling indicated. Although the exit polling in terms of the outcome of the election was very, very accurate in California. Uh, but maybe it was somewhere in between. So instead of maybe being a change from 70% white to 55%, maybe it was more like 70% to 60 or 65%, something like that, and so forth and so on. But even regardless of that, clearly it was a different electorate, markedly different. How different is under debate, but it was markedly different, and indicates that the, it, as I wrote it in a column uh, the other day, uh, this was not your grandfather's voting group of voters or even your father's group of voters. This is a different kind of political uh, voting electorate that's emerging in California. And it may moderate somewhat in subsequent elections because generally non-presidential elections have lower voter turnout, but clearly the pattern is set that the, the reign of the, uh, the old white person as a voter in California is coming to an end. And that was also indicated in the election results, which is the second big thing that happened uh, last Tuesday, that uh, number one, the voters voted to raise taxes. And that's a very unusual thing in California. Voters in California in the past have always resisted raising taxes, even taxes that they themselves weren't going to pay. Just last uh, June, for example, the voters of California rejected a cigarette tax, even though only 15% of Californian adults smoke, second lowest rate of any state in the country, second only to Utah. So even though they, most of the vast majority of them, were not going to be paying the cigarette tax, nevertheless, they voted against it. 
continuing a pattern of resisting tax increases that's been fairly consistent in California for a number of years. But last Tuesday, something new happened. They voted to uh, pass Proposition 30, which is the governor's uh, sales and income tax increase, and also Proposition 39, which was a change in corporate taxation worth about a uh, billion dollars. So maybe the, the old mantra about Californians won't vote for new taxes is now different. Or maybe it was just an aberration in this one election. We don't know. Because clearly, that different voting profile made a difference on Proposition 30. There was a great surge of voter registration right before the election because a new law allowing online voter registration went into effect. And we know people under 30 don't know how to do anything unless it's online. And they did. And hundreds of thousands of new voters, most of them young, registered to vote. And clearly, many of them did vote, as witnessed by the change in the profile shown by the exit poll. So that was one thing that happened. You had a different kind of electorate turnout. And one of the things this electorate did that they had not done before was to raise taxes. And the exit polling told us at 8 o'clock on Tuesday night that that vote would be 54 to 46 on Proposition 30, by the way. And it was just about exactly what it was. So the exit polling was quite, quite uh, accurate. So that's another thing that bears watching. That's a new, another trend that this election pointed up that may or may not follow through in future years. We'll see. But at least it shows a different sort of mindset than has existed before. The third thing that happened that was significant was that the Democrats, this was a very good election for Democrats on several fronts. And one of the fronts, again, reflecting a different electorate and a high voter turnout, only 29, only 28 percent of those who cast votes last Tuesday were Republicans. Everybody else was either a Democrat or essentially a declined to state voter. Uh, one of the things that happened was that the Democrats achieved two-thirds supermajorities in both houses of the legislature, as well as picked up several congressional seats, albeit not as many as they had hoped to earlier in the year. They had hoped to take retake control of Congress, buoyed by a big surge in California. They didn't get quite get that big surge, but they did pick up a few seats. But in the legislature, they did get two-thirds to it. Everybody knew it was going to happen in the Senate. That was a foregone conclusion. But it also happened, to the surprise of many, including myself, in the assembly. And in fact, just today, the very last 54th Democratic was, was declared a winner just today, uh, guaranteeing that there'll be two-thirds Democratic majorities in both houses of the legislature uh, for at least the next uh, couple of years. And there's a lot of speculation about that. What does that mean? You know, I, you talk radio and pundits and tweets and all the stuff that goes on. There's a lot of speculation. What's it mean that the Democrats have two-thirds majorities in both houses of the legislature? First time any party has had that, by the way, since 1933. The last time anybody had it in 1933 it was the Republicans, not the Democrats. And there's all this speculation that's going to be something like the French Revolution. All Republicans are going to line up and be beheaded. Uh, 47,000 new taxes will be enacted. Uh, marriage with dogs will be legalized. <laughs> you know, all these things, all this uh, uh, tweeting and twittering and out there in the blogosphere and whatnot, it's not going to happen. Let me tell you why it's not going to happen. First of all, the governor doesn't want it to happen. And he's got to sign everything that comes through the legislature except for constitutional amendments. Uh, he wants to take it slow, and he's reiterated his pledge that there will be no new taxes without voter approval. Not going to go there, he says. Uh, secondly, it's going to be a long time for they actually have two-thirds votes of people sitting there. Two senators, two Democratic senators, were elected to Congress last week. They're going to resign immediately to go off to Washington. So right away, the Democrats lose two Senate votes, and they no longer have a two-thirds majority. And their seats will have to be filled by special election sometime in the early part of 2013. But there's another senator who's going to be leaving to become an L.A. city councilman. So he'll have to fill his seat by special election. And most of those who are going to win those special elections are going to be Democrats, assembly members. And so they've got to resign. 
And then you have to have special elections to fill their seats. So it would probably be late next year sometime before they could, might have two-thirds actually sitting there to vote on both houses. And most, well, not most, many of those who will be sitting there don't want to vote for new taxes because the only way they were able to get these two-thirds majorities, super majorities, was to win some swing districts. And there are a lot more swing districts than there used to be because of the redistricting that went on. And if you're just barely made it into the assembly from a swing district, a Democrat, you don't want to turn around and vote for new taxes and get knocked out in the 2014 election. So there's a reluctance to go out there and be wild and crazy because wild and crazy will get you unelected. So it's going to be, it'll have an effect, but it will not be sudden and it will not be more than likely dramatic. So what are we likely to see from having the Democrats with two-thirds majority in both houses? It probably won't mean an awful lot in terms of legislation because the governor is very reluctant to, to do anything like that. Uh, you know, he's, a, he's gotten cautious in his uh, upper years, his older years. Uh, he plays with a dog now rather than running around with Linda Fron uh, Ronstead. So he's not interested in, he wants to build a legacy. He wants to come back. This, is, this governorship is like a mulligan. It's a do-over. You know, he kind of said, you know, I didn't do so good the first time around. And think about it. He was elected in 74. He ran for president in 76. He ran for re-election in 78. He ran for president again in 1980. And he ran for the U.S. Senate in 82. His first governorship was a perpetual campaign. He never bothered to govern California. He was not interested in governing California. He wanted to go off and be a rock star someplace. Well, so he said, well, you know, that doesn't look too good. You know, in the history books, that doesn't look too wonderful. I mean, may, everybody loves my father, but everybody thinks I was crazy. So I'm going to come back, and I want to have a record. Well, the, he doesn't want to have a record of being the guy who went wild and crazy. He wants to say, well, I'm mature. I'm paying attention. I really want to do it this time. And so he doesn't want to do anything crazy. What you'll probably see out of this two-thirds supermajority um, at some point, some point in the next two years, let's say, is you'll probably see some constitutional amendments that be placed on the ballot because the legislature can pass constitutional amendments with a two-thirds vote without a governor's signature. It doesn't take a governor's signature. It's one of those little quirks of law, but that's the way it is. And so what might you see placed on the ballot in 2014? Well, you might see uh, something I wrote about in this morning's B, a measure to make it easier for local governments and school districts to pass taxes. Maybe something that lowers the voting threshold on partial taxes from two-thirds to a simple majority or maybe 55%. Or allow cities to uh, pass specialized sales taxes with a simple majority rather than a two-thirds uh, vote. That's very much on the agenda. And that you can just about take it to the bank. Something along those lines will probably uh, be done. So, they, you know, it's untouched by human hands. We didn't raise taxes. That's up to local voters. But, of course, if they raise taxes at the local level, it takes some of the pressure off the state budget, right? Because all those finances are intertangled. It's all basically one big budget, if you really look at it closely enough. What else might you see? You might see a measure of legalizing same-sex marriage, overturning Proposition 8. Very much a great deal of interest in the legislature in doing something like that since Clearly, public sentiment has changed on that issue in California, and other states, as witnessed what happened last week, are moving down that path as well. So that's a likely thing. You'll probably see a new water bond issue. There was a water bond passed in the latter days of the Schwarzenegger administration that um, was supposed to be on a 2010 ballot, was postponed to 2012, supposed to be on a 2012 ballot, it's now been pushed off to 2014. Now it's just basically going to be thrown away and they're going to start all over again. What will be in it? Who knows? When you start writing water bonds, it's like, who knows what's going to be in it, you know? The one that's already there that they're going to throw away had some stuff in it that, frankly, was indefensible. You know, like a quarter of a billion dollars to Warren Buffett. I mean, come on. You know. Yeah. You want to know how that works? Do what I know. A uh, quarter of a billion dollars for Warren Buffett. Like he needs the money. Um, so there'll be some stuff like that, probably. Uh, some 
and you'll see a few things. But the legislative leadership knows now that they own the game. It's theirs. They can't blame the Republicans anymore. So whatever happens, happens on their watch, and they're going to be held accountable for it to one degree or another. And that brings us to the state budget. The voters passed Proposition 30, a quarter cent increase in the sales tax and surtaxes on those with $250,000 of taxable income and above, topping out uh, at 13.3% for those with a million and above, the highest marginal tax rate of any state in the United States, and the highest sales tax rate, by the way, as well. It's supposed to raise about $6 billion a year. They're actually counting on it for $8.5 billion in the current year's budget because the income tax is retroactive to January 1. Yes, it's already being, it's already there. It's already happening. For those of you who might be affected by it, and I wish you well. I wish I was affected by it, I tell you, too. Um, I'd be happy to pay the 13.3 if I had a million dollars income. Um, so it's supposed to raise $6 billion a year after this year. Will it happen? There are rational people who believe it will never get to that because it's basically taxing rich people on capital gains, and who knows what capital gains are going to be. If anybody can guess capital gains, good luck. Capital gains are somewhat a voluntary form of income. You don't have to take them if you don't sell anything. And who knows how many people are just going to change their addresses to their ski lodges in Incline Village up in Nevada. I mean, who knows, right? Don't know. Don't know. But it's, and they're also counting on $2 billion from the Facebook IPO, by the way, for this year's budget. Even if they get the $6 billion, or they, excuse me, if they get everything they expect out of the thing this year, this and during this fiscal year, the budget still has a deficit because of these other things that are, that are going on. Uh, down the line, what it does is really it's like a Band-Aid. It's not very much money even if they get everything they hope for. The state budget is in reality about 25, even with this money, about $25 billion out of balance a year. How do you figure that? Because they were, up till the recession hit, they were spending $100 billion in the general fund, a little over $100 billion. But the tax system, until this thing came along, was only generating about $80 billion. So they were just running up these big deficits every year. Uh, about $35 billion worth of deficits over the last several years. If you extrapolate that $103 billion that it was, I think, four years ago forward, it should be around at least $115 billion today. Even with this new tax increase, they've got $90 billion, so they're about $25 billion short of what they were a few years ago. All those people who think, oh, we passed Proposition 30, happy days are here again, all these cuts are going to be restored. No, they're not. All it does is finance this year's budget and something similar to this year next year, but none of the, the reductions will be rescinded, essentially, uh, whether it's health and welfare programs or anything. It just kind of keeps them from cutting more a little bit or postponing more, putting more on the credit card. And a lot of this money has got to go to pay off those debts, what Jerry Brown's called this wall of debt, $35 billion, most of which, or much of which is owed to the schools. So all the school money you were told that these ads the schools are going to get, it's basically money paying debts that they're already owed, and money that they have borrowed against as recounts are receivable. But is that going to mean any money, new money in the classroom? Virtually none. It was not telling exactly the whole truth. Plus the fact that the other piece of Proposition 30 was a constitutional amendment. It's all a constitutional amendment, but the other piece of it was a guarantee to county governments that they're going to give counties $5 billion a year for so-called realignment, taking off prison inmates mostly. That's a permanent spending commitment locked into the Constitution with escalator clauses to be financed out of a temporary tax. Any fool could tell you that a constitutionally guaranteed expenditure financed out of a temporary tax means that you're going to have a problem when that temporary tax expires, which it happens to do just as Jerry Brown's turning over the keys to the governor's office to somebody else. So is Jerry Brown fixing the state's finances? Not yet he isn't. And this doesn't do it. 
this kind of is a postpones a few things. It kind of eases things for a few years, but it doesn't fix the fundamental structural thing, what people in the capital call it, the bean counters call a structural deficit. A structural deficit being our paper commitments to spend X amount of money being higher, much bigger than our actual revenues in the door on the other end. That's a structural deficit. That structural deficit has resulted in $35 billion worth of deficits just in the last few years. Debts, money that's been borrowed from uh, schools, 10 plus billion, money that's been borrowed from the highway funds, money that's been borrowed from banks, uh, money that's been borrowed simply by not paying bills. And, and that doesn't fix that. It closes the gap a little bit. It narrows the gap, but it does not close the gap. So this, but now the Democrats have got it all in the Capitol. They own it. They can't blame the Republicans. It's obstructionists, which they do. They own that situation and will be held accountable for it. And I know that a lot of them think, well, we can always raise taxes down the line. Well, maybe they can, maybe they can't. But Jerry Brown says he won't do it unless the voters agree to it. So there, in some ways, the passage of Proposition 30 creates as many problems as it solves for those in, in state government. And then by extension, therefore, those in local government as well, particularly in counties and school districts. Uh, it's not the big fix. It's the little fix. But by settling for a little fix, which he thought was all he could get the voters to go for, and he was probably right, uh, it kind of dissipates the ability to get the big fix, at least on the revenue side of the ledger. So if you think you've heard of the last of budget travails in Sacramento, no chance. They're still going on. They still will be going on. There's never going to be enough money to satisfy all of the conflicting demands, and the budget situation is going to be, uh, in some ways, just as bad as it's been in recent history. Now, the way out of that, some hope, is the economy is going to expand dramatically. We're going to get another boom of some kind. Money will roll in the door, and all our problems will be solved. Well, I'll leave that to the next speaker. But uh, no economist that I know have read, even the most optimistic ones, see anything more than a very slow and sluggish recovery. They don't see any booms around the corner in California. Which raises a, a final question that I'm going to pose to you, a final situation. That if California is not going to get another boom, and remember, we've had three booms and three busts in the last 30 years. Defense boom, defense bust, high tech boom, high tech bust, housing boom, housing bust. Once a decade, we get a boom and a bust. And if we're not going to get another boom, and I'm not, in some ways I think we shouldn't get another boom because they have corrosive impacts, you know, the hangover after the binge, uh, then we have to go out and compete in a global economy. We have to kind of regularize our economy. We have to look for a sustainable economic model in California. And that means we have to compete for investment capital. And that's when our deficiencies become biting. That's when our high tax load, we just raised it a little higher. Now we've been the fifth highest in the country. Maybe we're, we're probably knocking on the door of fourth in the country. Highest tax load, state and local tax load, as a percentage of personal income. Our tax load, our regulatory structure, our really crappy highways, you know, worst traffic congestion in the United States, and the second worst roadway condition, second only to New Jersey, according to the Federal Highway Administration. In New Jersey, Tony Soprano buries bodies in the road, and it makes them lumpy, particularly. We just do it by simple neglect. Um, a K-12 school system that is evidently in crisis with very low test scores and extremely high dropout rates, 50% in LA Unified, for example. Uh, and uh, other kinds of things that make it difficult, at the best, for us to compete in the global economy, and I know what you're going to say, yes, we have great weather. Yes, we do have great weather. But is that sufficient anymore? That's the question, when we have other competitive disadvantages. And that really will be the more acid test, I think, of Jerry Brown's governorship and this new democratic hegemony in the capital, is will they be willing to recognize some of these deficiencies and pay attention 
to the uh, creating a more sustainable economic model for California rather than simply uh, praying every night for another boom to come along. And if they don't do that, and if they're not willing to accept that there is a problem there to be solved, then I think they, their reign, regardless of what happens, will be uh, a failure. Uh, after all, everything else in both our private lives and in our public sector stem from a prosperous economy. And I don't know how long we can continue having two million unemployed people in California, officially, not counting those that have dropped out, moved away, or whatever, two million unemployed people, the second or third highest unemployment rate in the country. Um, I mean, I think it should be a, a matter of shame, truly, that California is in hock to the federal government. That $35 billion doesn't include another $10 billion that we owe the federal government for loans we have taken out to keep unemployment checks going on in this state over the last few years. We can't even afford to pay the interest on those loans. And in fact, the state last year and again this year and probably the next again next year has been borrowing money, three to four hundred million dollars a year from the disability insurance fund paid by employees to pay the interest on our loans from the federal government on the unemployment insurance fund because we're so belly up broke and because there's not the will in Sacramento to do something about the unemployment insurance system that is terribly broken in this state. I mean, just completely bankrupt, if truth be known. And it's a indication, I think, that the political establishment in Sacramento tends to want to ignore inconvenient reality and then hope that somehow a miracle will occur and rescue them from having to deal with uh, that reality. And on that happy note, I thank you very much. I want to introduce our next speaker, our very own. How fortunate are we? to have Dr. Peter Rubert not only uh, as the chair of the economics department at UCSB, but also the executive director of our program, the Economic Forecast Project. Um, Dr. Rubert has extensive background in both education and economics. He has served on the faculty of several universities and was also the senior research advisor at the Cleveland Federal Reserve Bank. And I the thing I love about Peter is that the data he presents is very accessible and actually entertaining. <laughs> Not all of us in this room, you know, are into economics as much as some of you. And I really appreciate uh, the, the data that, that Peter presents and how he presents it. So let's get on. We've moved from politics and policy. We're going to move on to economics. on? Okay, good. So thanks everybody for coming. Um, can't do this without the sponsors. It's great. Um, and thank you, Dan, uh, for leaving it up to me uh, to do the economics. So here's the title. Post-election stress disorder. <laughs> so now the hard work begins, I think. Um, so how is the U.S. doing? I put this slide up almost all the time, and you think, you know, he just repeats himself. I'm trying to bash this into your skulls. This is a picture of the United States. This is the logarithm. Some of you remember what logarithms are, doesn't matter. Um, that thing has an upward trend to it. It grows about 3% a year. Why am I usually an optimistic person? It's because of this. I could take this back to 1870, by the way, and it grows at 3% a year. So what does that mean for us? Real gross domestic product means we're getting 3% richer each and every year, on average. There are some periods where we get recessions. Why do we get recessions? Who knows? 
There isn't a forecaster out there who can tell you why, when we're going to go into a recession, believe me. You can see the little wiggles, those are business cycles. And many of you in the back can't even see the wiggles. <laughs> right? That's how small business cycles are relative to our long-run economic growth, which is the thing that's important, which is why we laugh at our great-grandparents, you know, when they say, I used to buy a steak for a quarter. And we said, yeah, but you had to work a week to get a quarter. Now we work 10 minutes to get a steak. We're wealthier. That means every hour that we produce goods, we produce more and more all the time. That's why I'm an optimist. I'll talk more about this as we go. The economy is recovering, but very, very slowly. And as Dan said, um, is anybody out there really predicting a boom? Well, if it, no, no one can predict a boom. No one can even predict a turnaround. That's one of the big failures of economic forecasters. When things are kind of moving along, they can tell you, you know what, next month, unemployment you know, is going to be about the same. Maybe it's going to fall a little bit if we're growing. No one can tell you we're going to rise a lot or fall a lot. It's really hard to do. Why is it that people, I think, are so up in arms about you know, this recession and the recovery? It's because almost every person compares our current recovery to previous recessions and recoveries. And the picture they look at is something like this. So what's this picture? It starts here at zero. What I've done, I've plotted every business cycle since 1973. And what you can see is this is real gross domestic product. That's that thing I just showed you with the long run growth. So what happens during a business cycle? Well, during a business cycle, we fall somewhat. And many people believe that what a recession is is two quarters of decline in real GDP. That's false, by the way. How do I know that? The National Bureau of Economic Research said 2001 was a recession. Real GDP never fell, not for an instant. Okay? So what happens? Real GDP falls somewhere between 2 to 4 or 5 percent. This current one is this thicker blue line. You can see the problem. The thicker blue line is farther down. That's a 5 percent fall. Again, let me explain what that means. That means that relative to the previous peak of the cycle, so all these things were indexed to the peak of the cycle, and then we're going to follow the economy as we go forward quarter by quarter. What happens is we fall a little bit and we start to come back. When we hit this zero line, that's the same level of income we had at the previous peak. What, is, what does it mean to be 5% below? It means we're 5% poorer. That's exactly what that means. Now, you can see the issue. The issue is in almost every recovery after eight quarters, which if you do the math is two years, <laughs> after eight quarters, we're typically back to where we were when we started at the previous peak. In this one, that number is 16 quarters. You do your own math. That's 16 quarters. What that says is we fell by 5% and we never really recovered compared to what we would have been had we had no business cycle. Okay? It took a long, long time. Now, is this the right comparison? I used to believe it was the right comparison. I've changed my mind on this. Why I've changed my mind is basically because this thing has gone on for so long and it's so worldwide. Maybe this was a shock to our economy, both domestically and internationally. It was such a strange, large shock. For example, the whole mortgage problem. Usually mortgage uh, issues, foreclosures, housing cycles are regional. We had a huge national um, uh, decline in housing prices. So what I decided to do was, what if we compare us to Europe, to other developed countries? Now why do I want to do that? Other countries, developed countries, have different monetary policies. They have different fiscal policies. Maybe we screwed up in our policies. Maybe that's why it's taking us so long. So what do I do? Well, remember I told you about this long-run growth picture. I'm a believer in that long-run growth picture. We have maintained that growth through all kinds of issues. World wars, the war in Iraq, Afghanistan, Democrats, Republicans, you name it, the Great Society program. You name it, that thing keeps growing at 3% a year no matter how hard politicians try to stop that from happening. Now, this is a picture of real gross domestic product for the United States, which is the dark blue again. 
Germany, France, the United Kingdom, Spain, Italy, and the Netherlands. Other developed countries, again, many of these countries in the EU have the same monetary policy. So what's going on here? You can see the US in blue. By the way, look at Germany. Germany fell by more you know, than the US did, and they came roaring back from this recession in terms of their real gross domestic product. Now, the point here is that who are the two that are gone above where we were at the previous peak in real gross domestic product? It's the US and Germany. Every other country looked at here, and I can show you other ones too, they've all started to dip back down. Right? So many countries in Europe are facing now sort of something like a double dip recession, not the United States. Okay? Other countries are kind of stagnating, but you can see Germany and the US, the only two. Now, what is it about those countries? So I can tell you about Germany. So Germany has gone through lots of reforms to their economy, labor markets, capital gains, taxes, all kinds of things. We'll talk more about that maybe. Now, what does this mean? Insufficient aggregate demand. What you're going to hear from politicians, basically, is the following. One thing the government can do is prop up aggregate demand. That during a recession, people aren't spending. Now, what does consumption mean? Consumption is 70% of aggregate demand. And many of you could remember this equation. Y equals C plus I plus G. That's just real GDP is consumption plus investment plus government spending plus the difference between exports and imports. That's what we mean by real GDP in the economy, or real income. Aggregate demand, people think, is sort of what's building up on to get us to this amount of GDP. And the thinking of governments is the following. If GDP is low, we have to fix one of these things. People aren't spending. So governments think, well, if people aren't spending, we'll spend. That's G. So this is the, the philosophical problem between you know, certain types of economists and other types of economists and politicians. What happens when you increase G? Let me tell you what Obama and in the administration has thought for a long time. If you increase G by a dollar, Y goes up by two dollars. That's called the government spending multiplier. The government spending multiplier is the government will go do something. And by the way, that goes back to Keynes. If the government spends more, then real GDP will go up. So what John Maynard Keynes said was, look, we can get stuck in a recession and we can't get out. The only way to get out is deficit spending. And by the way, politicians love to hear those words from a famous economist. You can go out and spend money and it helps the economy. Now, what do other economists believe? Other economists believe for every dollar spent by the government, we consume or invest a dollar less. That government spending multiplier is zero. Why would that be? Well, when the government spends money, where do you think they get it? You know where they get it, right from your pocket. The only way the government can spend money is to raise taxes. Governments don't produce anything. They raise taxes and they do stuff with it. Now, that's the philosophical divide right there. It depends which you believe. Personally, I believe in the zero government spending multiplier. Why? I think people are smart. I think when they see governments raising deficits, they know that's got to be paid back. Maybe by me, maybe by my kids. Somewhere down the road, someone has to pay that back. Now, this is about aggregate demand. This is real consumption expenditures. That's that C I was telling you about. So what the government might be saying is, look, we need to, to boost up this C. Well, I just, again, here's Germany, France, and the United States. Our kind of aggregate demand, our consumption is, is kind of okay, relative to, relatively speaking, compared to other countries. So maybe whatever that shock was to our economy, maybe it just took us a long time to get out of it. Now, how about the labor market? Unemployment, as I've said many times, it's not the best statistic. I say it again, it's not the best statistic because if the labor market's so bad that somebody who's looking for a job fall, drops out of the labor force, the unemployment rate actually falls. Why? Because they're no longer looking for work, they're not even in the labor force, so the, so the unemployment rate will fall. That's not a very useful statistic in my view. 
However, it's very powerful in the wrong hands because what people say is, look at all those poor suffering unemployed people out there. We've got to do something to help them, create jobs. And if you just listen to what I said, by the way, governments can't create jobs either, right? They don't produce anything productive. That's not a mean thing to say. I'm not disparaging governments, by the way. It's that all they do is tax and, and, and spend money somehow. They can hire people, but where do they get the money to hire people? Payroll taxes, maybe, income taxes, who knows? Now, this is the unemployment rate. Again, the dark blue is the United States. This is Spain. This, by the way, is the percentage point change from the 2008 peak. What this says is Spain's unemployment rate went up by 17 percentage points. It went from 8 to 25. The United States and Germany are the only two countries in the past year whose unemployment rates are actually falling. It's a slow trend down, don't get me wrong. And there's something happening in the labor market. I don't know what that is. I told you Germany made some corrections to their labor market. Spain did not. Here's a statistic I like to look at better. This is the civilian employment to population ratio. This is the number of people who are actually working who could be working out of the population. Okay? This is the United States. It's unbelievably bad. This thing has fallen by 7% since its previous peak. Now, it could be that we had too many people employed before. Who knows? But the point is, it's not coming back where Germany came back like crazy. Other countries are coming back. So there's something going on here with employment. And that's why all politicians say it's about jobs. That was about the election. It's all about jobs. We have to get something to get people to hire workers. I know you were depressed for a minute, but remember this? This is a long run optimism growth. So it's true the election's over, and some uncertainty got resolved, but I think there's still a lot of uncertainty out there. Now, many of you, I'm going to show you some pictures that I, I, I showed a few months ago. Uh, I showed last time in, uh, at the Granada Theater. Um, what's the uncertainty that I see out there still? This is a picture of excess reserves of depository institutions. For those in the back, this number down here is zero. That blue line is sitting right on top of zero. It's not actually zero, it's pocket change above, but it's zero. And then you can see, in two, a little after 2008, depository institutions held up to $1.6 trillion. Now, last May when I talked to you, that number was, you know, right here. So yeah, it's gone down a little bit. I remember the three Fed presidents that were here, that some of you attended that, they talked about it. We'll figure out how to do this. Some of them said. Um, we've never been in this territory before. It's true we have theories about how to get rid of these excess reserves or to stop them from coming out of the system too fast, which would cause inflation. We'll see. That's still uncertain. This is a picture of what I call Federal Reserve Policy Tools. I know you can't read any of these things. That's fine. You'll get the point in a second. The Federal Reserve System typically was an $800 billion central bank. What does an $800 billion central bank look like? An $800 billion central bank held about, 800 and, um, about $750 billion of short-term treasuries. That's what our Federal Reserve System was holding, and they always held that. They dealt in short-term treasuries to manipulate interest rates to affect the money supply and inflation. That's what they did. So we went along for a while, and then things started getting bad here in two, late 2007, 2008. The Fed started doing some crazy things. They started to lending a lot more to financial institutions. They started buying things. They started bailing out companies. They did all kinds of things. And their balance sheet, they decided here that, yes, we're going to do more of these things like lending to financials, but at the same time, we don't want to change the size of our balance sheet. We want to keep it at $800 billion. Therefore, we'll get rid of these short-term treasuries. So what they were doing, they were just changing the mixture in their balance sheet. Well, at some point, they realized they couldn't do that any longer, 
and they just let the balance sheet go crazy. This number up here is $2.8 trillion. It went from $800 billion to $2.8 trillion. Now, the, this green bit here, this is the stuff um, um, that you've seen that the, treasuries, uh, the, the Fed is now buying these long-term securities. You can see here, before this date, the Fed really held no long-term securities. It was all short-term stuff. This Operation Twist they were after, that's what this green stuff is. Operation Twist is simply a way to say, listen, we don't think the economy is doing well right now, even though interest rates are zero in the short run. Those long-term rates, they're still way up at 2%. We've got to get them down. So they're thinking that going from 2.5% for a 10-year, drop that down to you know, 1.7, businesses will go crazy and start hiring people. They'll start investing. If that's the margin people are playing on, you know, I, I don't know who's telling them that. But. And this bunch of blue here, these are mortgage-backed securities. So this is you know, going from you know, close to um, $750 billion up to one. So they have a trillion dollars worth of mortgage-backed securities in their system. It's gotten smaller since the last time I showed you this picture a little bit. Some of these things go away over time. They get paid off. And by the way, people are now looking for returns. This was said, told to us by uh, one of the Fed presidents that was here, Charlie Plosser, Federal Reserve Bank of uh, Philadelphia. He said, you know what? The New York Fed is actually starting to make money on these things now because returns are so low for people, they're now buying these risky investments from the New York Fed to get some return. Well, that's a bit crazy. We just tried to stop people from doing that, but there you have it. So now let's talk about the fiscal cliff, or maybe it's called the fiscal mogul. So what's the difference? So the difference is the following. This was not like the debt ceiling problem. The debt ceiling problem was a serious problem. Why? We owed people money. If they didn't change that, we'd have to default. The US has never defaulted. By the way, going back to 1776, never defaulted on our debts. That was a big argument you may have remembered by Alexander Hamilton, all these guys. But we never defaulted. Defaulting would be a bad thing. So this is not like that, the fiscal cliff. What's the fiscal cliff? The fiscal cliff is actually easily avoidable. We don't owe anybody any money in the fiscal cliff. So my view of the fiscal cliff is basically it's not about the debt. I think this argument has gotten moved a little bit to think it's about reducing the size of the debt. So Simps, Alan Simpson and Erskine Bowles are here. Maybe some of you attended that. I was lucky enough to moderate that and um, had breakfast with them. And you know they're very interesting guys. They have a very nice plan, I think. Um, they cut some corners, but it's good. Um, my view is this has to be about tax and spending reform, not about reducing the debt. OK, so this is embarrassing. I'll tell you right now, this is a bit embarrassing for an economist to say. No economist knows what the optimal size of the federal debt should be. They guess. No one knows. There's no theory about the optimal size of debt. You'll see some people say 90%. That is, when the, when the debt held by the public gets to 90%, that's when things start to go bad. Where do they get that information? They look at Argentina. They look at Greece. They look at these countries that don't look anything like the United States or Germany. No one believes that it's 90% for the United States. In fact, a Nobel laureate economist, I'll show you a, a picture in a second, um, uh, um, talked about that. So let me show you what this is. This is a picture of the Congressional Budget Office, what they have to do is they have to give a projection of what's called a baseline projection of the federal debt held by the public. Why held by the public? Because the US different agencies hold their own debt. So what we care about is stuff that we owe to other people, not to our own government. So that's why we care about federal debt held by the public. This is 1940 back here. What's this debt? About 110% of GDP after World War II. Amazingly enough, this debt fell in five years to half its size. In five years, it went from 120 to about 60. 
And about seven years later, it was down to 40% of GDP. So don't let anyone tell you that it's really, it's hard to reduce the debt. It's not, right? We can do it. We know how to do it. It's been done before. Now, what are these projections? By law, the, the Congressional Budget Office has to say, under current law, what do we project the federal deficit to be? Now, under current law means there's certain things about tax cuts, the AMT, et cetera, et cetera. Most people did not believe that those laws were going to stay in existence after January 1st, 2013. And so what they said is, we need an alternative fiscal scenario where maybe some of those things stay in. And so you can see, depending on whether or not these tax cuts stay in, AMT, the medical stuff holds, we're either going to see a large rise in the debt or it'll fall. Now, what does the Simpson-Bowles plan have? This little dashed line is the Simpson-Bowles plan. Note that in the Simpson-Bowles plan, I'll give you just a brief idea of what it is, taxes, marginal tax rates are lowered for everybody. They're going to get rid of all kinds of loopholes. They're going to get rid of all kinds of things that we care about in there. Their view is you increase the tax base, you're going to get more tax revenue. Right? So this is going to be the fight going forward about whether or not we're going to raise taxes. That's the Republicans say. Obama just said two days after the election, you know, no plan is going to pass my desk that doesn't make sure that people who make more than $250,000 do not pay more, uh, pay their fair share. And by the way, while he said it was a mandate, he had to, do, to say that, I think the stock market fell like two days in a row after the election by like the largest they've fallen in years. But anyway. So what is it about this spending that we care about? What's the issue? So the issue is, it's really about health care. These are mandatory spending packages. This is the CBOs, the Congressional Budget Office, baseline spending projections going out to 2022. And you can see that health care programs are basically going to more than double. Spending on health care. This is Social Security. Paying for old guys, like me. This, this is crazy. So when I said that there was this Nobel laureate who has this paper out that I, that I really like, what he said was, listen, there's no theory about the size of the debt. Because people invest in human capital and they go to school and they get educated, um, you shouldn't tax their labor income currently and pay for old people. That's a bad plan. Why? We know that taxing things means you do less of it. If you tax labor income, you know that people are going to work less. They're not going to get as educated if you're going to tax their income away. So rather than taxing current workers today to pay for old people, this guy's plan is the following. Let's have the government borrow and pay for all the old retired people right now. Okay? Just pay for all of the Social Security. Get rid of labor taxes completely. Don't tax labor. Let the government borrow. How much did he say they should borrow? Five times GDP. I told you right now it's about 70, 80% of GDP. He said let it go to five times GDP. Who cares? Now, what's the argument against that? The argument is that people say there's things called crowding out. If the government's borrowing money, it's raising interest rates and private people don't borrow. This is a very subtle argument, by the way. It's not quite right. So the reason people talk about this crowding out of government borrowing is because when the government borrows, they don't invest it at the same rate as other people invest it. Those aren't projects that people want. Here, we're just borrowing. We're letting young people um, save and then pay back when um, uh, they're, they get paid back when they're older. It's a very simple scheme. Get rid of labor taxes, let debt go to five times GDP. Now, it's a bit wacky, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we're going to do that. I'm just saying that we should be very careful to think about what we mean by trying to reduce the deficit. And a short-term problem like um, uh, taxing labor more is not good for the economy, period. Now, turning to California for a second. How are we doing? 
These are Standard & Poor's credit ratings as of July 13, 2012. California has this nice peach color. Oh, it turns out that nice peach color is the lowest credit rating in the United States. Looked at di differently, you can't see this, but you can see the colors. This dark green are AAA ratings. By the way, Maryland has had a AAA rating for 50 straight years. This on the right side is 2001, on the left side is 2011. And you can see that there's a lot of green, there's people going from gold to green, from red to green, and California went from gold to bad. It's last in 2011 in the credit ratings. It was last in 2001 in their credit ratings. So California has been suffering from this issue for a long period of time. Now, a little bit of an update on the local economy. Unemployment. There's been a slow downward trend in unemployment here. So this is the monthly unemployment rate. It's not seasonally adjusted for California. And Dan was talking a little bit about this. California's unemployment rate has used to be similar to the United States. The gap has grown wider. Here's Santa Barbara um, County here. By the way, this is, uh, I'm going to use lots of different features in this talk. So, um, So um, this is a Google uh, app anybody can, anybody can have. This is public data. We're using this in the forecast project. I'll show you how we're using it in a second. Google has a lot of money, it turns out, and they spend lots of money on graphics and getting people to do graphics. So our thinking was, why not use that? We have our data. We'll use their tools. So I'll show you how we've done that in a second. So this is a picture, again, of uh, this is the unemployment rate, not seasonally adjusted. And these things are pretty cool. I mean, you can, um, you can go back in time to 1950. You can play around with this. There's 1990. You can add stuff if you want. You can add different places. Lots of fun things you can do, but you know, you'll be able to do it. Um, so I just added Santa Clarita. That's here. So you can see California is pretty much above. Now, this is the unemployment rate differential between California and the US. So what do I mean by unemployment rate differential? Well, you can see back in um, the early 90s, we were only about um, you know, 8 tenths of a percentage point different than the US. It grew to almost three percentage points different than the US. It fell to back to about 0.5. And then during this last episode, you can see the unemployment rate differential between California and US is the largest it's ever been going back for a long time. Now, why is that? Why is California in this particular episode and maybe earlier episodes doing worse? So this is a picture of construction employment as a share of total employment. California is the orange, and the United States is blue. So you can see back in the early 90s, the share of employment in construction wasn't very big. And then what happened? It started growing. We started con constructing a lot of stuff. It grew, and it grew, and it grew, and it's starting to employ manual laborers. Right, so this sector started growing. It grew, it passed the US in early 2000, and then it continued to grow. So as a share of total employment, construction became very, very large relative to what it used to be, 3% up to almost 6.5%. So the construction sector in terms of employment grew a lot. Now, the problem, that's all good, right? I mean, people are getting jobs. They were unemployed. Maybe they're getting jobs in the construction sector. The problem is construction is the most volatile sector we have. What do I mean by most volatile? Well, this green is non-farm employment for California. 
The orange is construction employment. So this stuff is, this is 20% decline, by the way, in employment, right? Non-farm fell by about seven, right? So construction is very volatile. It changes very rapidly. So what was going on in, 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 the, uh, in this sector was, you know, we now have lots of people employed in the construction sector. We have this huge housing mess, and we lose all those people becoming unemployed. Is it clear it's going to come back and get fixed? Who knows? Employment, well, again, slow trend up in employment. This is total employment for Santa Barbara County. And you can see that, by the way, we left it, you know, not seasonally adjusted. Why? It's kind of nice to see not seasonally adjusted because you should remember that in lots of industries, there's this seasonality component. And many people, when they see a change in employment, they might attribute all of that to, you know, we're getting better, when it turns out it's just a seasonal factor. So you can see these seasonals in employment. Every season, you know, it goes up, goes down, goes up, it looks very much the same. And you can see the recession here. We had very, very slow growth going up in non-farm, service, goods, and farm. Again, this is what non-farm looks like, and this is the point I'm making, that you can see that these are negative numbers, which means it was declining. We came out of the recession. The non-farm sector in Santa Barbara County started to grow. These are positive numbers, so we were growing at 1%, 2%, et cetera. And then, you know, sometime late 2011, we started to slide back a little bit. So the employment's stable, you know, maybe declining a little bit here in Santa Barbara County. Where are these issues coming up in terms of employment? Well, retail trade. Retail trade has not come back yet. It fell, still falling, employment in retail trade. It's down from about 20,000 to about 16,000. So we lost about 4,000 jobs in Santa Barbara County in retail trade alone. Manufacturing, here's the construction I just told you about. These are financial activities. Financial activities, again a decline, and then a very, very slight, maybe upward tick. Turning to the housing sector, I've heard this a lot. Right now, it's the lowest inventory Santa Barbara's ever seen in housing for sale since they started keeping track of these statistics. Here's a picture of South Coast. This is for South Coast now, just the South Coast. It's, not, it's very deceiving to look at South versus North, by the way, so we're just going to look at South Coast. So this is a picture, again, and you can see the volatility seasonally. The blue line is the, app, is the data, and you can see it's the lowest it's been since 1993. This is the lowest inventory ever. This red line is a 12-month moving average. Now, as I told you, some of this is seasonal, right? So we're not getting into the high season for selling houses. So listings typically fall. Part of that is the seasonality, yet part of it looks like it might be a little bit of a trend down in listings. Houses prices, I say stable to getting stable. Why is that? This is the US. So you can see in the, the red line are median home prices. Median home prices fell, as you can see, and have maybe been almost holding their own. Maybe slight declines. These are sales, single family resales. And again, you know, up a little bit, but, you know, kind of holding their own. Again, this multimedia. So this is a picture of um, uh, housing prices in Santa Barbara, Goleta, Santa Maria, Lompoc, Guadalupe. And again, you can see the decline. This is 2007. You can see the decline, and then basically held their own, a slight decline here. Goleta, very narrowly declining, maybe sort of holding its own, and these other ones, you know, fairly small. So are we coming back fast in, in housing prices? It doesn't look like it. Inventories are low. It's not saying we're not 
getting worse, it just doesn't look like we're getting a lot better in, in many dimensions. So we have this thing now. Um, it's a little movie. So we made this little movie. Um, it's a boring economics movie, but um, it's not a movie like you thought of. It's a movie that's going to show you every house sale per month since 2005. You're going to see every one. This comes from the assessor's office. Um, the blue represents just the house price sale. The red will be the median house price. So the median house price, right? The median is just um, take all the houses that got sold, find that housing price such that half the houses uh, were above that and half the houses were below. That's the median. And then we're also going to look at the mean, just the average sale price. So obviously, if you know, there's a few real big sales, the mean is going to be bigger than the median. So now you're going to see a little movie starting, and, and you can see these are sales. This is the dollar amount, and each one of these bars represents a sale. This is above four million up here. You're going to see what's starting to happen as we get closer and closer. This whole thing shifts down. It shifts down, and we get fewer big sales. That's the movie. <laughs> it probably won't win any awards, don't get me wrong, but here's the, here's the conclusion of that movie. Here's the end of the movie. April um, of uh, 2007, the blue lines are April 2007. This is what the distribution of house sales looked like in April of 2007. You can see there was lots of sales compared to now. And by the way, we want to look at April versus April for that seasonality thing I was telling you about before, compare April to April. And you can see that over 4 million back in 2007, lots of them. And you can see a large number of them, over 2.5 million, relative to very few in April of 2012. So what has happened is the entire distribution has shifted, right? Fewer of these sales, and they're lower. These sales are all lower priced. And if you go back, this is the median house price. You can see the median house price in October 2012, about 749,000, I think it was. And when you go back to um, 2007, this number's over a million, the median sale price. Thanks. That's it. <laughs>